Let's imagine it's 1995 all over again. I would have been 14-ish and probably glued to my 486 SX100 PC. Most of the time I was just playing video games or doing schoolwork, but there were times, usually around 1 or 2 in the morning, where I'd be typing as quickly and as quietly on my keyboard as I was able to. I'd be telnetting into BBSs or remote terminals at the universities in the city here. And if I was really lucky, I could get into one of those university networks and usually find an HP LaserJet printer. And with a few simple command strings, I could change the ready message to something stupid like, I'm sad, or I need a hug, or I'm hungry. Too bad, feed me Seymour, wouldn't fit. Those kind of silly hacks actually opened doors for me later in life, as I interned out of high school as a systems analyst, and then eventually found my way into photocopier and printer repair. At the time, I remember seeing trailers and TV spots for a new movie that was all about computers, and I was hooked. And even though I couldn't hack my way into free movie tickets, I saw this movie when it came out on VHS and loved it. So let's take a slice out of the 1995 film, Hackers, and see if we can mess with the best or need to die like the rest. The movie begins with the Secret Service, or FBI, making a raid on the main character Dade Murphy's house. The young boy is convicted of computer crimes and forbidden to own a computer or a touch-tone phone until he is 18. Fast forward seven years, Later, and Dade and his mom move to New York City. And lo and behold, Dade starts up again. After a failed attempt to keep control of a TV station, we see Dade attempt to fit in at his new school. Shortly after, he meets Kate, and then the Phantom Freak, a fellow hacker and freaker, and Joey, a wannabe hacker. Soon after meeting Serial Killer and Lord Nikon, Joey haphazardly breaks into Ellingson Mineral Company's supercomputer and copies a random file. Unknown to Joey, the file contained a worm program that was stealing money from all the transactions that the company does and was placed there by the company's security officer, Eugene Belford, a.k.a. The Plague. Joey gets busted and Crash Override has a competition with fellow hacker Acid Burn to see who's the best. Plague discovers that Joey has part of the source code to his worm and uses the secret service to put pressure on Crash Override to find out what they know. Dade bends and gives up the code and the group decides to take out the Ellingson supercomputer with help from hackers around the planet. Serial Killer exposes the plot with help from elite hackers Razor and Blade and the secret service turns on and arrests Plague and Crash Override goes on a date with Acid Burn, and a new elite hacker team is born. So I don't think that in 1995 there was any more hacking that was going on than today. If anything, the focus was probably less on hacking and more on freaking. For those who don't know what freaking is, it is essentially manipulating phone systems so you don't have to pay huge long distance charges. The technology mentioned in the movie, cutting edge at the time, seems laughable now, and the internet was just a shadow of what we know it as today. The fashion in the movie is a bit over the top, but that might have been what the kids were wearing in New York in 1995. I remember a lot of those fashion styles in my early high school days as rave and electronic music were slowly taking over from rock and grunge. Interesting to note as well, the majority of all the hacking done was in a local area code. Most small-time hackers at that time stayed local because local law enforcement didn't really know about computer crimes. They didn't care or have the resources to deal with them. One scene in the movie sums this up nicely. As Phantom Freak says, you don't hack a bank across state lines unless you want to get nailed by the FBI. This movie holds a lot of nostalgia for me, so I'm going to try and be as objective as possible. Hackers has obtained classic status, and you could argue that it is a cult movie, but not because it's an amazing hidden gem, 
but probably because it's so nostalgic for lots of people and because the story could be easily told today, but just with updated technology. What's interesting about the main cast of characters is that you can see how everyone has their own style fashion-wise, but they don't all have to be the same to like the same things. As mentioned before, the cutting edge technology at that time seems laughable, but it holds a lot of memories for me because I first experienced the world of computers on similar hardware. I remember adding DIMMs to upgrade RAM, using dial-up modems, sending text commands through Telnet or Hyperterminal at 2 in the morning to a printer on a network, war dialing, building hardware gadgets for phone freaking. <sighs> I should probably talk more about the movie. The cast of characters are enjoyable and play well off each other. Lots of the cast would go on to be very successful actors. I should also mention that, like my review of It Came From Beneath the Sea, this movie has many references to old movies and TV shows. So, now to my dislikes. Well, this movie gets a lot of things right about hacking and computer work, there are some things it gets really wrong. So I've known some hackers and a lot of very proficient computer analysts and none of them have designed their own graphical user interfaces like the characters in this movie. Some of the hacks in the movie are just not possible, like turning on fire sprinklers or messing with traffic lights. The depiction of the Ellingson network is a great in the abstract explanation of a network, but it's far from accurate as to what it would actually look like. Mind you, a blinking cursor on a black screen with lines of text isn't very dramatic. And on that note, there just is a little too much drama. For the most part, you can see the elements of what real people in that era and subculture of hackers would be like, but it's over-exaggerated and that really just serves as a narrative device. While Hackers is no masterpiece, it is an enjoyable film to watch for anyone who wants to get the feels over vintage computer or mid-90s teen culture. If you can ignore the dramatic license, you'll find it quite enjoyable. I'll give it an A. An aged Gouda that has a sharp displacement at first but followed by a nice soft creamy texture that will conjure up fond memories of waiting to get on the net with your dial-up modem. My name is Ryan, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and remember, you can't spell cheese without a B.